and welcome back to Book and Page. Hey, we are finishing our first book of the season. Yes, this is the final video for Percy Jackson's The Lightning Thief. I kind of, that kind of was cheering. It was kind of cheering. Yes, so we are just doing the last two chapters today. That would be chapter 21 and 22. So let's go ahead and jump right into it with a summary of what happened in those chapters. So, chapter 21, it turns out Percy is no longer a wanted fugitive because obviously he and his friends were kidnapped by a madman on a motorcycle who's been doing all of these bad things and they're innocent victims and Percy is brave enough to fight the man off gun to gun. Cool. Reporters believe it. In fact, the reporters give them the story. They just have to go along with it. And the reporters even save up enough money collection-wise to get them all tickets back to New York. Percy survives the flight, but it's the most terrifying thing he's done this entire trip. And when they get to New York, after evading more reporters, they split up. The plan is that Percy will head to Mount Olympus to return the lightning bolt, Well, Grover and Annabeth return to Camp Half-Blood to explain the story in case Zeus decides to kill Percy, is, is basically it. So Percy ends up in the Empire State Building at floor 600, and wouldn't you know it, Mount Olympus is just a decapitated mountain kind of floating over the city with a Greek city on that mountain, and Percy is in awe. He also understands why Hades is probably so bitter about only being allowed here once a year. Understandably. Understandably. Percy goes ahead, though, and returns the lightning bolt to Zeus, taking the time to explain the story to both Zeus and his father Poseidon. Percy's father Poseidon, not Zeus's father. And Zeus decides to reward Percy for this good deed by not killing him. In fact, he actually kind of rewarded him by not killing him twice, because he did allow him to fly that one point, but actually tells him directly, do not ever attempt to fly again. I will kill you. Thanks. Zeus then heads off, even though both Poseidon and Percy suspect Kronos, Zeus will not hear about it. Poseidon and Percy are left to talk, and they talk about the possibility of Kronos being guilty, and also the fact that by having Percy, Poseidon has given him a fate that is not a happy one, that is a hero's fate. And Poseidon kind of basically says that Percy never should have been born. Percy's like, thanks dad! I'm gonna go now. But Poseidon does say, good news though, Hades has returned. Your mother, once his helm was returned, and there's a package going to be showing up, so make your decisions. Percy then leaves Mount Olympus and heads over to his mom's apartment to have a heartfelt reunion with her. Ruined, of course, by Smelly Gabe, who can't shut up and wants Percy arrested for the loss of his car. It's bad enough he had to return Sally's life insurance money. <laughs> Gabe, you are literally the worst. Percy and Sally continue to talk, though, and a package does show up. It is Medusa's head, which has been returned to Percy the sender. Percy basically offers to his mother that he'll go out and kill Gabe for her, and Sally refuses. She says that your father also offered to solve all of my problems, but I need to learn to live my life myself. I need to have the courage to make these decisions, not rely on anybody else. Percy understands that and says, I'm going to head back to Camp Half-Blood for the summer, and they decide that they'll figure everything else out later. And that's when we get chapter 22, the return to Camp Half-Blood. Back at the camp, the end of the quest and the safe return of the heroes is celebrated in the usual way. A really big feast, but they also burn the shrouds that have been made for them if they don't return which would also be burned, but in a different way. When you're burning these shrouds yourself, means you survived. Ultimately, they spend the rest of the summer doing normal camp activities and training, though there are a few things that are different. For example, Grover has received his searcher's license and he heads off on his quest to find Pan, leaving on July 4th. 
Additionally, Percy also finds out from his mother that Gabe disappeared. She sold a statue that looks surprisingly like Gabe and has received enough money from this statue to put in for a new apartment, for schooling at the local university, she wants to be a writer, and she's even put a, down posit a deposit down so that Percy can come to a local private school and be able to live with her and attend school for 7th grade if he wants to. Percy puts this decision off right to the end of the summer and even then he doesn't know what to do. So he heads off to do some sword practice to clear his head. Meeting Luke there, the two of them head off into the woods to drink some coke and have a chat and oh wouldn't you look at Luke's the bad guy. Turns out the prophecy wasn't quite done. Luke is the one who would betray Percy. He summons a scorpion, basically tells Percy that he did successfully steal things from the gods, got got by Ares, and then knew what to say through Kronos to convince Ares to help. And then he's just been lying low at camp, summoning beasts every now and then, and making the tension rise. He is leaving now with his special sword, Backbiter, and Percy's gonna die from that scorpion sting. Luke disappears, Percy does get stung, but he makes it back to camp before he blacks out, and wakes up successfully alive thanks to Chiron. Things go a little quick from there. Basically, oh look, Kronos is the big bad guy. Chiron's off to Mount Olympus to tell the gods, and both Percy and Annabeth decide they will attempt this year at home with their families, because that is what is important. They do make an agreement, though, that they will come back next summer with the plan to hunt Luke down. If they're not given permission for a quest to leave, they'll sneak out and do it anyways. And that's how you set up a series! <laughs> It's also how you finish a book. We do successfully have the ending of this quest, the Civil War has been prevented with the return of the Lightning Bolt, and Percy kind of gets... kind of kind of gets some things solved. I, it's, a, it's a very interesting sort of pair of chapters where you're seeing the development of a lot of characters come through like a lot of characters. We're finally getting a better understanding of Zeus and Poseidon, even though they're still the big scary god figures over there type um, development. Zeus for sure, because he's the big guy and he's basically like, I've let you live, I will continue to let you live, leave. But you can also tell again that just like Ares, they're not infallible. The fact that Zeus refuses to talk about the possibility of Kronos coming back, um, that tells it right there. The fact that Zeus is like, no, 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 we're not talking about it, no. That says that something about the outcome with Kronos, Zeus is not happy with. And probably it's the fact that, like, the gods, the titans can't die. So Zeus having to face the fact that he killed his father and now his father is probably out for revenge isn't exactly something he wants to spend his time doing. He wants this victorious moment of the Master Brook having been returned and not going to war and he wants himself to be the one deciding that. He doesn't want to find out that there is another power out there that could ultimately overthrow him. That's surprisingly a very human thing. You definitely meet people who do this, who will deny something purely because it means that they're not in the powerful position. That's, yeah. So even these great big characters who seem really scary, we are getting moments here of fear and concern. There are cracks in the armor that we need to be aware of. And again, that's how you set up a series. By providing those cracks early on, we then have so much more exploring that we can do. And the fact that we've already got another prophecy mentioned in these chapters, that's helping it. And then Poseidon, oh! 
Oh my god, Poseidon. Sometimes, sometimes you definitely have moments where characters are just like saying something and you're like, stop talking. Like, stop. Shut up. Stop talking. And it's this moment of like, you never should have been born. Not, not a great way to talk with your son. Not a great way of, of communicating with your son. But that's, again, we have to keep in mind a god speaking. So the human moral compass there, a little bit skewed, a little bit skewed. And Poseidon kind of tries to backtrack on that because he basically says like, but no matter what, you are my son and I won't deny that. So it's kind of like, uh. And again, the gods also seem to be aware of something else. So Poseidon talking about um, Percy's hero's fate, and a hero's fate is never a happy one, is sort of Poseidon recognizing that he couldn't provide something for his child. He can't protect Percy going forward. He can't make sure he has everything he wants in life. And this is really interesting, then combining it with Sally's growth in this chapter. You're not really expecting Sally to have a, a moment of self-realization, except she does. She has this moment of realizing that Poseidon always offered to give her everything. Which is precisely the growth that then Poseidon is having. Like, these two really have to be paired up with each other and you have to look closely. The growth that Poseidon has is his realization he can't provide everything for those he cares about. And Sally's realization is she can't rely on any everybody else to provide for her. She does sort of have to fight for that. And truth be told, she hasn't been fighting for herself this entire time. She has been fighting for Percy. That's why she ended up with Smelly Gabe. That's why she ended up just working at a candy store rather than following her dreams. It's why she sacrificed herself to the Minotaur. It's all been for Percy. So this moment of self-actualization is also Sally realizing that Percy is now his own individual who has to make these choices. She doesn't come in as a mother and say, okay, so you're going back to camp, you'll be back here for September, and you're going to start seventh grade. She doesn't try and make that decision because she realizes that Percy, in the position he's in, is going to understand a lot more about himself and the dangers he's in than she is. So allowing Percy to make the decision whether or not he stays at camp is again growth on Sally's part as well. And part of that is also the growth we see with Percy. Percy is now mature enough to make that decision. Sally realizes that, but she doesn't realize the full growth that we get, which is actually Percy's hesitation about killing Gabe. When he realizes the Medusa's head is there, he realizes exactly how easy it is. Like, drop the box on the poker table, open it up, start a stone garden right there. And he hesitates. A very self-aware hesitation as well. He admits that a few weeks ago there wouldn't have been any hesitation there. Any opportunity to kill Gabe, he would have done it. And what's weird is this hesitation comes after a really horrible realization, which is that Gabe has hit Sally before. Because he, he hadn't really realized it. He knew that he and Gabe didn't get along well, and his mother had to deal with the verbal side of that, he didn't realize an, initially that she had been hit before. And now he's becoming so much more aware of those around him and people's actions that he is aware of this physical side of things by the way Sally moves. 
when Gabe moves too quickly, which is Sally draws back. Sally's ready for the hit and is flinching back. So you think this would solidify of like, okay, mom, you stay in here, I'm gonna go kill him. But Percy's also realizing he can't always be judge, jury, and executioner on that one. When he thinks about the fact that he was in the underworld, it is suddenly this question of, do I have the right to send anybody here? And so, <coughs> he doesn't make that decision on his own. He allows Sally's agency here as well, and accepts when Sally says no. He accepts the reason for it, which is actually giving her power back in this relationship. It's not Percy insisting he keep power for himself. He's allowing his mother to make grown-up decisions for himself, herself. Just like she is allowing him to make those decisions for himself. It's a fantastic moment of mutual growth that ultimately ends with Gabe being turned into a garden statue. And it's, it's sort of weird because you're just like, how do I feel about this? If even Percy hesitated in doing this, how should we feel about Sally doing it? And I don't think there's an easy answer there. This, this problem, just like the train problem of last video, this problem is one that comes up in our media constantly because we are constantly trying to deal with it. Which is the concept, if you kill a killer, the same number of killers still exist in the world. Do you punch Nazis? And when you're in the privileged position of not having been a victim, it's really easy to say that violence just continues to produce more violence. But that, I fully recognize that thought comes from a very privileged position. When you are an abuse victim, and you are part of that group that is being told they shouldn't exist, that they're not human, that they're not worth the same amount as another person, because of their sexual orientation, the color of their skin, anything like that. Well then it's, it's suddenly not like that, is it? Trying to act nice when literally people are hurting you or saying that you shouldn't exist, well that's, that's not fair. That is basically asking you to play on a level playing field with people who are not on your level. People who are above you punching down. And you try and swing back and everyone's like, oh, don't do that. So Sally, in this moment, you have to recognize as an abuse victim, taking back power. and what that means when it comes to Gabe becoming a statue. I can't judge Sally here. I am in a privileged position. And that was her decision. I applaud Percy from, for stepping back and allowing Sally to make that decision and Sally insisting on making that decision, not letting Percy do it for her. But fully, that choice is never going to be one I understand. Uh, knock on wood, which is to say I might be put in this position at a future point and then understand it very fully. But again, this is why we need literature, but it's also why you need to discuss literature because there are going to be some decisions that characters make that you won't understand because of the position you've been in. 
but somebody who's had different experiences is going to read that situation differently. And I really think this sort of Gabe statue moment is fully one of them. So I'm very curious how other people read this moment, especially other people who have been in abusive situations. Because that perspective is going to change, and the relationship to the character is definitely going to change. So it's fascinating to have these moments, but you always have to be aware of your own biases and what your own experiences are then saying about it. And be willing to back off and say, I'm in a privileged position where I've never had to deal with this, so I can't say what about the situation is good or bad. That's growth for us too. That's the other fascinating thing. As we're watching all of these characters grow, we are learning to grow ourselves. And we're then recognizing signs and symptoms of our own actions that might be perpetuating some of these problems, causing some of these problems, things like that. For example, when Luke comes in and we have this conversation with Luke and Percy, isn't that precisely two sides of the same coin? Which is to say, two young men whose fathers had them and then left, but still had expectations for them. Who were branded as outcasts and delinquents were thrown into this non-childhood having existence by being half-bloods, thrown into camp and then thrown out into a quest, and then coming back from that, we are seeing characters that are very similar to each other. The experiences are not perfect. For example, Luke's quest didn't go well, and he's ultimately scarred for it. Uh, Percy's quest did go better, and he actually had a conversation with his father and there's the, the mother side of things, which you only find out in a much later book, which I won't mention. But the mother side of things is also different. So having these moments where the two of them are talking and seeing the world from different perspectives, that's important for us as well. Because then we're seeing the argument laid out about the world and what is owed to people and what they can fight for and what they need to accept and those are becoming very different ideals in these two characters. Luke and Percy are sort of splitting here about whether or not it's worth it because Percy through the quest has seen the small moments that are often overshadowed by the negativity, but he's seen the small moments, the friendships you can make, that has led him to believe that life is worth it. That the world is worth fighting for, even if the gods are flawed, even if humanity is flawed. It's not worth destroying everything. You're going to cause so much more damage doing that. Well, Luke is seeing the negative side so much that ultimately he's pushing back. He's throwing punches. But his anger is just spread. He isn't pointing at specific things that are wrong. And this, this is personified in Backbiter, the sword. This is an absolutely terrifying weapon in which a sword is made partly out of celestial bronze and can be used against the supernatural, godly side of things, and part of it's made out of steel. It can be used against mortals. Luke's entire argument is against the e immortal, godly side of things. But his anger is just spread so much that it's not about that ideal anymore. It's not about the fact that the gods have done wrong by society and society needs to overthrow them. It is that Luke has been wounded so much by society and the gods 
that he just needs to lash out and, and kill. There is no reason to have that steel side of the sword if we have Luke talking about an ideal focusing on the gods. His anger is just spread to everything. Because you can understand his anger with the gods, with Hermes as his father, not caring for his kids. But Backbiter then says that Luke's gone beyond that. And he just wants to hurt and hurt and hurt. Maybe because he wants people to feel how much he's hurting. But again, that's the difference between Sally and Luke. In an abusive situation, lashing out at the abuser is different than lashing out at everybody. So Backbiter suddenly becomes the alternative to Gabe's statue. And maybe that's going to also, again, change our perspective on Sally's choices. And Sally might change our perspective on Luke. The backbiter scares me. And Percy's decision not to be like Luke is important. There's a conversation happening outside my apartment, so I'm going to... I'm gonna go. I'm gonna call it. It's been a fantastic read through Percy Jackson and the Olympians number one, The Lightning Thief. I'm so glad you joined me for this, but this has just been the start of book and page. We are continuing on next, still in the realm of the Greeks, though we're going ancient Greek on this one. So next up is some Greek comedies by Aristophanes. We'll be starting with frogs and then continuing on to wasps after that. Just as a reminder, each video will cover about half a scene. The first one, well, we'll be meeting that soon. But first, let's do a rundown on Greek comedies. That will be our next video before we get into Aristophanes himself. So, I'm going to get reading, and I hope you do too. See you next time.